are, but again, there's some uh, fundamental principles that still live on today. The museum is one of those that really continues to talk about the principles, the integrity, the leadership, the courage, those that are demanded by our men and women in uniform. Demanded. But the museum, preserving the peace through the lessons of the past, isn't that isn't that really pretty resounding? I mean, just think about it. You know, being a, a mission statement. Mm -hmm. If we can just sit down and start thinking about all the various lessons that we wish that we would have could just pass on to those, how much, how many things would be corrected? How many things would we adjust? Whatever the case may be. But again, that's part of the process here, folks. Is that we're talking about young individuals, and again, I go back to that photo, that original photo. We're talking about young individuals who think that World War II was a video game. We're talking about sharing the message of the men and women who serve our country to students who only read one chapter about General Patton and the U.S. Army and actually read more about Rome. Think about that. They read more about the German. General than the United States. That's an, it's an interesting fact. Interesting, interesting fact. So, uh, now this is a, just a beautiful picture, by the way. Um, we actually, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but you know, this statue here, again, everybody, this is iconic, by the way. Everybody that comes to the museum, um, I can't tell you how many people I walk by and they'll just take a snapshot of this, of this photo right here. This iconic. And, um, and this is something that I've seen multiple times with the rocks behind it and whatnot. It's just amazing. <coughs> For those that have been out there, I believe almost everybody here, you can say, you can pretty much agree with me on that, right? Just amazing. Oh, oh, oh okay. <coughs> This is something that I found <coughs> very, very interesting. Wars may be, uh, may be won, uh, fought with weapons, uh, but they are won by men. <coughs> It is the spirit of the man, or the men, who follow and of the man who leads that gains the victory. And this is one of those things where I found this little quote from General Patton. We're talking about all of those, the spirit, the, those little primary integrities, those primary principles that General Patton was sharing at this moment, again, when we start talking about the men who have earned the Medal of Honor, we're talking about the spirit of the man. We're talking about the people who are running towards the war while everybody's running away. We're talking about the spirit of the man. When we're talking about those that are helping their buddy while they're injured during a fight, we're talking about the spirit of the man. But we're talking about people that stand up for us so we don't have to do the fighting ourselves. <coughs> That's what we're talking about. And again, I couldn't say this any better. I had to put it in. Just you know, one of those things. The museum is actually, uh, again, when we're talking about like, the stories of the past, we, you know, we have a, a memorial brick and tile program. And I don't know, you guys have been there. It's grown since, I guarantee you. Okay. In the last six months that I've been here, uh, the, the museum has seen significant growth in the amount of people that have come out and actually purchased a brick and tile. Okay. Uh, in fact, there was a gentleman the other day that actually bought five tiles. Again, it, not cheap, by the way, folks. Uh, but it, he bought them all. He was just like, I want all of these names on it. I want to put them on. I want to get them up because they, they deserve it. Again, talking about strangers, people coming through randomness. Over one million travelers go through on I-10. But randomly, you get those few that come through the doors that really shake things up. By the way, today we had a Holocaust survivor come through. How many times have you had the honor and the privilege of really sitting there and talking to a Holocaust survivor? That is something remarkable. That changes your world. And again, it's the stories and the memories of these individuals that we're sharing. And again, you know, everybody here, you know, seeing the brick, 
around the wall and around the general patent because, again, it belonged around the general patent. But during that story, that moment with the Holocaust survivors, he told me that General Patton, he was on his convoy going out. And about that time, he, the, the lead jeep stopped because they had eight guys that escaped from, uh, you know, escaped from prison. And he cussed them out. <laughs> he cussed the, the front jeeps out. He's like, why in the world did you stop him? Well, with more of language. And then he turned around and he looked at these eight guys. And then he had this conversation, brief conversation, and he found out who they are. And he came to his attention and saluted every single one. And he told every single one, Godspeed. Now this, this Holocaust survivor had his granddaughter with him. Now, as an executive director, this is something that I get to experience on almost on a daily basis. Where those type of memories, where you see the, the granddaughter hearing her grandfather tell these stories, and she's just in tears. Now, these are memories that I'm going to have. And these are memories that I'm sure. But this will always stay with me. But the memorial wall, we have over 35,000 people come to the museum. And even though these bricks don't do anything other than just stay here and show the name and what war they represent, they share more than that. They share the memories. When the families come to the museum, they treat it as a memorial, as it should be. Because oftentimes, there's no, there's no body, there's no grave. So they treat it as if it was. That's what we're talking about. This is a great, great picture. Uh, I actually found this, uh, you know, in our archive. Uh, it was early on, and now we kind of stretched all the way around and, and through. But uh, but we focused mainly on the Korea Vietnam Defenders of Freedom Wall. After 9/11, the museum established the 9/11 Wall, which they should have, like rightly so. But we're talking about various things here, and again, I actually wanted to, to talk briefly about this, because again, uh, the General Patton Memorial Museum memorializes all who protect our freedom. These walls honor fathers, grandfathers, brothers, sisters, and friends. Everything. And everything in between. Now, one of the highlights, and everybody stops and takes pictures, and you know, I see people go, you, you guys seen the fence, right? I kid you not, in the six months I've seen some crazy stuff. You guys, California is crazy. Okay, so I've seen some people like go up to that fence and like play like they're on it or play like they're moving in one of the tanks. And I'm like, what are you people doing? Uh, <laughs> but, but we have some impressive pieces of military history here. Uh, we, we have a uh, Sherman tank, which I want to talk a little bit more about that because this is actually a picture of our Sherman. Uh, uh, we actually had the Persian tank, which again, the Persian tank came later on in the war. Um, I actually seen some documentation of the Persian tank against a tiger tank. This is brutal. Um, if you ever want to see that fight, uh, I guarantee you right now the Persian wins. Yeah. Now, uh, but we also, again, we have various military equipment. Now, this is part, I'm going to talk, I'm going to kind of touch base here, and I'm going to come back to it, uh, because this is also part of our future. Now, right now you see this tank, and, and again, those that came out about like a, about a two years ago, how many, you know, was it hot and kind of, kind of beating down on the, the military vehicles, right? Now, anybody that knows museums know that we're here to preserve the past, right? Preserve the past. We're actually restoring a steward tank right now, and we just received $25,000 to complete it. So the museum in this year will have a completely restored Stuart tank. As long as they find the parts and pieces. That's always the catch, right? Yeah. Now oftentimes when it comes to restoration projects like that one, <coughs> you can't find the parts and pieces. So they have to make them. They have to modify or make the parts and pieces. But by the, uh, hopefully by the end of this year we will have 
parts and pieces for a completely restored tank. At that point in time, I guarantee, you, if you guys would like to come out, you guys are more than welcome to have a open hatch night um, to actually see the restored tank. That's it. That's what we're doing. I knew that I would catch the cup. <laughs> okay. Now, again, I told you that I was going to come back to the Sherman tank. The Sherman tank was actually known, it was actually considered the, the, the most produced. Uh, it was a mid sized tank. And, but I'm going to actually get a couple of volunteers. Actually, I'm going to get you. Yeah. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Ivan. Ivan. Okay. Everybody say hi to Ivan. Hi. Uh, okay, so I'm going to. Ivan is my tiger tank. Uh oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, Ivan is my tiger tank, but however, you guys just happen to be my Sherman tanks. Oh boy. You're my Shermans. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, Ivan, he's about, the Germans have only made about 1,300. Only 1,300, right? Okay. The United States made over 50,000. 50,000. Now here's the catch. You're a heavy tank. You're a mid-sized mid tank. Your armor in some spots are only 0 .5, 0 .5 inches. Do you guys realize that a 50 caliber bullet will go through that? Do you guys realize that the heaviest spots of your armor is only seven inches? Making sure that's correct. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Man, I've been talking tanks all day today. So, seven inches thick. You, on the other hand, my man, you, your weakest spot just happens to be about four inches thick. Okay? Your weakest spot just happens to be in the rear. Mm. That sounds a little weird. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's just what it was. I'm saying how it was. Okay, now your objective as the Sherman tanks, your objective is to try to outflank him and get him and attack him from the rear with his weakest points. Now, the catch is, is that there, there's actually technically two <laughs> weakest spots. <laughs> technically, technically, here's the thing, technically there's actually two weakest spots on the, on the tiger tank. It's on the belly, don't, don't, don't get on the ground, <laughs> uh, and, and the rear, okay? So oftentimes what happens is that the men would actually, they would attack the tiger tank when it comes up and over the hedgerows, because it would, what would it do? It would show his belly. Side. It shows his belly. It shows oh, a weak yeah. spot. So they would actually take uh, like a bazooka, you know, something that could pierce the armor in a weak spot, and go right there. Boom. And, and then at least that would just disable the tank and maybe kill the majority of the guys inside. However, you, on the other hand, you guys are, you guys are gas. What does gas do? Burns. Okay, so guys, you, on the other hand, you guys mainly have, you're, you're running off of gasoline, which burns. Again, the Sherman tank was also, was known as Helen 